Wow, uh, the smoking lamp is lit. Uh, smoke them if you got them. I just thought I'd reminisce for a minute there. General Whistler, that was the greatest introduction I've ever had in my life, not only because it's the only lieutenant general to ever introduce me in my life, but that was just wonderful. Thank you very much. I, wow. I, 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 let, let me tell you something. I, I'm almost the oldest honoree. My military record pales in comparison with my fellow honorees tonight, but, um, but I've been at it in the military, sorry, maybe longer than the others. My Marine Corps serial number was six. But I hasten to add that I am younger than Clint Eastwood. <laughs> Clint Eastwood, you recall, the recent Republican National Convention, his main duty that night, what he was there for, was to bond and relate to the millions of American families across this nation who keep an addled old uncle in the attic. <laughs> I can say this because in my family, I am that old uncle. I've often said that when I went into the Marine Corps, it was kind of anticlimactic having gone to a parochial school. After the nuns' boot camp was a piece of cake. I still break into a cold sweat when I remember my eighth grade teacher. And you Marines will appreciate my eighth grade teacher's name, Sister Mary Chesty Puller. Now, I'm often asked about the connection between what I wound up doing for a living and, and my Marine Corps background. And, and people wonder how I got into this crazy idea of writing topical songs, parodies to old songs about uh, topical things. And I first had an awareness of the idea of writing a song parody from my grandmother. Uh, she's here. Uh, well, I'll, no, she's not. She was, she was here earlier, but she wanted to go to Georgetown to hang out. Anyway, my grandmother had lived during World War I, and she would sing a song that was a parody of Yankee Doodle. Now, World War I, uh, we fought Germany, and they were led by Kaiser Wilhelm, right? Kaiser Wilhelm, and he was known as Kaiser Bill. So my grandmother was saying, when Kaiser Bill went up, no, no, it's <laughs> Kaiser Bill went up the hill to take a look at France. Kaiser Bill came down the hill with bullets in his pants. And that's just adorable. Now, later, when I, when I became a Marine, uh, I got another example of, of a parody. Now, U.S. Marines and U.S. sailors had a common enemy, the United States Army. <laughs> and I knew some older sergeants who had actually been in World War II. And they sang this parody. Oh, we sent for the army at Guadalcanal, but Douglas MacArthur said no. He said there's a reason it isn't the season. Beside, there is no USO. So we got an idea of that. Now, I have younger grandchildren who I have led them to believe that I not only was in World War II myself, but I was one of the flag raisers <laughs> on Iwo Jima. <laughs> They're just little kids now. And, and, and so they had the picture, the famous Joe Rosenthal photograph, you know, and they looked at it and said, well, Grandpa, which one of them is you? I said, the one with his back to the camera. So what I was doing, I was pretending to be a member of the greatest generation. But I am uh, too young to be in the, uh, in the greatest generation, and I'm too old to be in the baby boomer generation. Now, the sons and daughters of the greatest generation, uh, many of them fought in the, in the wars, but uh, many of them fought to get across the border into Canada. So you have on one side the greatest generation, the other side you have the baby boomer generation. I am a member of that awkward, out of place generation in between the two more famous generations. We never had a name. We did everything we were told. We were drafted, we went. We never protested, we never demonstrated. 
We never had a name because, let's face it, we didn't deserve it because we were the dullest generation in the history of this country. How dull were we? Yes, we wore T-shirts. What was written on those T-shirts? Nothing! We didn't have enough imagination to put anything on a stupid T-shirt. But the baby boomer generation, oh, from the day they were born, you know who you are. You got all the attention. From the day you were born, the media was focused on the baby boomers. Oh, the baby boomers are in school. Oh, the baby boomers are now in college. Oh, the baby boomers just got married. Oh, the baby boomers are now middle age. Oh, the baby boomers just turned 60. I turned 60. Nobody gave a shit. I apologize, but after all, this is a Navy crowd. Now, <laughs> what stuck with me in the Marine Corps, a couple of things. Somebody would complain about something, and the sergeant, beginning with, with the DI, and later with other NCOs and, and, and some officers, would say, now don't go having your mother right here, Congressman. They held that over. They, they, you know, they, they learned from that. They were a little bit worried about that, that some kid is going to write to his mother, and then his mother is going to write to her congressman, and you're being mean to my little boy there at Paris Island, see? So the other one was, whenever we would gripe about something, and we would complain about, why do we have to do this? Why do we have to do this, Sergeant? The answer very often was, Yours is not the question why yours is about to do or die, but then they would follow that with, you're not supposed to know the big picture. And that stayed with me all my life. What, what do they mean? The big picture, well, the, big, big, the biggest picture of all comes from this city. All of the directives and all of, the, of their bosses were here in Washington. You're not supposed to know the big picture picture. And I have dedicated my life, ladies and gentlemen, to learning the big picture. I'm not there yet, but I certainly have a better idea of the big picture than I did 60 years ago. Okay, today, the big picture, let's say, in Congress. What is the big picture in Congress? Gridlock. Gridlock is a new normal. Gridlock. Give you an example. Last spring, Congress wanted to commemorate the holiday Cinco de Mayo but they could not agree on a date. <laughs> the big picture, last couple of years in the military, the end of don't ask, don't tell. Now, I, I, I agreed with that, doing away with don't ask, don't tell. Uh, they uh, seem to be working fine, uh, no, no problems, uh, gay serving, opening in the military, fine. A oh, couple of small changes, like every morning at Reveille, the buglers play show tunes. And of course, in New York State, they legalized same-sex marriages, and this paved the way for Donald Trump to become engaged to himself. <laughs> You've driven out in the country, and you see these signs, adopt a highway. You've seen that. Adopt a highway. If a gay couple adopts a highway, will the highway grow up to be straight? <laughs> the big picture in the world today is that we are divided. We are fraught with divisions all over the world. My goodness, Israelis versus Palestinians, Shiites versus Sunnis, Democrats versus Republicans, Romney versus Romney. I mean, we see it all over. <laughs> the big picture at the recent Republican National Convention was Mitt Romney's acceptance speech, obviously written by a very young speechwriter who didn't know how to spell the word Afghanistan, so he left it out of the speech. The big picture at the, con at the uh, Democratic Convention was Bill Clinton putting Barack Obama's name in for the nomination. Focus now on the historic symbolic significance of that. Bill Clinton introducing Barack Obama our first black president introducing our second black president. The big picture 
In the past couple of, uh, couple of decades, the Cold War is over. Thought I'd give you some good news. And the Cold War is over. The Berlin Wall came down. Soviet Premier Mikhail Gorbachev came to the United States and he went on a speaking tour. And he spoke at Harvard University and at that speech, one of the Harvard students asked him a hypothetical question. He says, Mr. Gorbachev, he said, what do you think would have happened if Leonid Brezhnev was assassinated instead of John F. Kennedy? Gorbachev thought for a minute, he said, well, Aristotle Onassis would not have married Mrs. Brezhnev. <laughs> the big picture. What of the future? I had a dream the other night of the future. And in my dream, they put Joe Biden up there on Mount Rushmore. But they couldn't get the mouth to stop working. The Korean War was still going on when I enlisted. And I was on my way to Korea, and the war ended, and I wound up in Japan. And so most of my tour was in peacetime. Now, when you were a peacetime Marine, in the 50s, for me at least, most of my time was spent polishing my shoes, polishing my belt buckle, and pressing my uniform. So when I was discharged, instead of coming home as John Wayne, I came home as Martha Stewart. <laughs> now, as the film showed, I was at the Atsugi Naval Air Station. And I did play the piano on the side in the slop shoot. I don't know if they still use that word, the enlisted men's club. And uh, I had a trio. There was a, a, a drummer, a guy played drums, and then a bass player, a really crazy guy from Brooklyn named Bob Zielinski. And Zielinski was in one of the pictures that were standing there in our dress blue. We were inside, by the way, if you notice that we were uncovered. But anyway, we played at the EM club, and I sang these silly little songs and stuff, and, and, and we clowned around in front, front of the guys in the slop shoot. And one night, a young uh, sailor, he was kind of a sanctimonious kid, he kind of pious kid, and he, and he was the chaplain's assistant on the base, and he was scandalized by these songs that we were doing. And he wrote an article about it, complaining about it, in the Atsugi base newspaper, where he complained about the filth, the filth and the obscenity of these so-called entertainers in the slop shoot. And we were called before the commander of the base, a full Navy captain. His name was Bandy, Captain Bandy. Full, he was the CEO of the whole base. And we're there in his office, and we are in trouble. And he's got the newspaper in front of him. He said, what, what's this about? What is, what, what is this filth? What, what is And Zelensky breaks attention, and he reaches over and he takes two pencils off of the captain's desk, and he starts drumming on the desk. I said, what the hell are you doing? And he's drumming on the desk, and he says, hit it, Russ. Well, I'm standing there. Uh, 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 on the beach at Waikiki, there's a gal you ought to see. She's got plenty of just what it takes. Each Kanaka native boy throws away his fish and poi. Every time that sweet Leilani shakes, now those Kanaka beach boys may be rough, but that's the way she likes her men. She likes them big and tough. She's got the biggest Kanakas in Hawaii. So get the hell out of here and we turn them down. And so, The fact that we were not punished, the fact that I was not punished, gave me the encouragement to spend my life clowning around for a living. And so I want to thank the Navy for my career, and more importantly, for this wonderful award. Thank you very much. Thank you.